Hi everybody, Neil Bakoven here. Welcome back. Let me tell you an incredible story. A story so astonishing and hard to believe that it matches up well with any science fiction you're likely to ever read. But this is fact, not fiction. It's a tale about the ancestors of most folks in the world today and the monumental undertaking they unknowingly accomplished, which has left us with some equally amazing and hard to believe outcomes. Here's just one, and try and get your head around this. An indigenous Australian is more genetically similar to a blonde haired, blue eyed Scandinavian halfway around the world than one African tribesman is to a person in a different African tribe that lives nearby. How is that possible? Well, here's what happened. About 70,000 years ago, one group or a few small groups of Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa into the present day Middle East. There had been other earlier migrations outward, some of which left genetic traces in the other indigenous human species out there. But none of those earlier ones of ours were ultimately successful. They all seem to have died out. But the migration about 70,000 years ago was successful, and how. We don't know exactly why this small group started their journey. Maybe they were searching for easier sources of food or water or a more moderate climate or just a better life. I have my own theory, which I'll share with you in a moment. But they likely crossed the Bab al-Mandeb Strait. It's the waterway that runs between the Horn of Africa and the Middle East. And once they got across, they followed what's been termed the beachcomber route. They moved all along the coast of Asia, then island hopped to Australia. And because it was such a small group, they had a relative lack of genetic diversity. Several research articles have estimated that as few as 300 people made the trip. But what's so amazing is that those few hundred people went on not only to populate the rest of the world, but also for better or mostly worse, they and their descendants eliminated or absorbed every other species of human on the planet. Think about that. For perhaps 200,000 years, all of Homo sapien genetic diversity was contained within Africa. Then this small group with their equally small genetic diversity, they make it out and they populate the rest of the world. Before we go on, here's a related question for all of you out there. What broad area group today has the lowest genetic diversity? Well, it's Native Americans. Think of it this way. A very small subset of all Homo sapiens left Africa with their lack of genetic diversity and they populated all of Eurasia then a small subset of that group with an even smaller genetic diversity moved into the Americas and populated those continents. Native Americans have by far the lowest genetic diversity in the world today. So the members of that initial African group, they're our direct ancestors. Essentially everyone in Europe, Asia, and the Americas today, 85% of the world's population regardless of nationality or ethnicity or geography, every one of them or us is a descendant of that small group of Africans. And even the remaining Africans, the ones that never left, yeah, they may have more genetic diversity, but all African tribes are related to the same ancestral population as those early migrants were 70,000 years ago. We are all family. Okay, so after taking the beachcomber route all the way to Australia and getting there by roughly 60,000 years ago and leaving pockets of people all along the way, some 15,000 years later, a subset of some of those pockets of people made it into Europe. And we know that story from episodes one and two. That's where this video series started as we met up with Neanderthals about 45,000 years ago in Southern and Eastern Europe.
be sure to check out those videos if you haven't seen them already. The migration out of Africa is what explains the bizarre oddity that I mentioned earlier. There's more genetic difference between a San and a Bantu, who are neighbors in Africa, than there is between two folks living half a world apart, say a Norwegian and a Papua New Guinean. One quick side note, oddly we seem to have maintained our dark skin for tens of thousands of years in Europe, whereas our eye color lightened up much earlier. Although there are a lot of conflicting papers on this, trust me on that one, there's a probability that Cheddar Man, who lived in Britain 9,100 years ago, had dark skin and hair, but crystal blue eyes. A couple of fun stories about Cheddar Man. Although he was named for the cheese that's now made nearby, genetics show that Cheddar Man was lactose intolerant. All humans at the time were. We didn't get the ability to digest lactose as adults until a few thousand years later. The other story is even better. Lord Bath, who owned the property where Cheddar Man's bones were found, had his DNA tested to see if he was a descendant. Turns out he was not a descendant of Cheddar Man, but his butler, Cuthbert, was. Are all English butlers named either Jeeves or Cuthbert? Oh, Jeeves, I'm so tired of this boring inactivity. I need a new adventure. What's up with that? But let's talk about Adrian Target, a mild-mannered history teacher who lives very near Cheddar Cave. He's been shown by mitochondrial DNA to be a direct descendant. So Cheddar Man's descendants managed to get a few hundred yards down the road after 500 generations. So back to our diversity discussion. African tribes like the San and the Bantu are less similar genetically than any two different Eurasian groups. In fact, let's pick two tribes that are even closer and have more similar lifestyles. A recent research paper documented that there is more genetic diversity on average between a couple of neighboring Bushmen tribes than between Europeans and Asians. Think about that. These two Bushmen tribes, called the San or Khoisan, are within walking distance of each other, and they have more genetic differences than an average European does from an average Asian. They've lived as hunter-gatherers for thousands of years, and they're likely the oldest population of humans on Earth, according to a huge African DNA study published in Science in 2009. The San are directly descended from the original population of early human ancestors who gave rise to all other groups of Africans, and also to the people who left to populate the other continents. By the way, the population of these Bushmen tribes who speak a <coughs> click language is dwindling. <coughs> there are only about 100,000 of them left compared to, say, Bantu speakers who number more than 45 million. You know, the whole subject about genetic diversity still just blows my mind. But let's come back to why that small group of Homo sapiens moved out of Africa in the first place. I'm a geologist, so I love looking back at what the Earth was doing during some of the big anthropological events. What was happening geologically that might have motivated or allowed us to break out of Africa? Well, measurements from the Greenland ice cap indicate that 70,000 years ago was the second coldest time in the last 100,000 years. Usually, as the climate becomes colder, more and more water gets tied up as ice in the polar areas, and that produces droughts elsewhere. And that does seem to have happened in Africa 70,000 years ago. And when the ice builds up, what does that do to all the coastal areas? Well, here's a hint. The very coldest time in the last 100,000 years was about 20,000 years ago. It's known as the last glacial maximum. And all the ice buildup drove sea levels 410 feet lower, exposing an area of land the size of South America. Think what would happen to Fort Lauderdale if you dropped sea level by 410 feet. All your beachfront property would be miles and miles from the ocean. Most researchers agree that all that new land 20,000 years ago 
facilitated and maybe spurred migration and, for example, helped people make it from Western Asia into the Americas. Similarly, the lowered sea levels in our time frame, 70,000 years ago, they weren't quite as low, but they allowed us to more easily cross from the Horn of Africa or find other routes out. The strait between the Horn and the Arabian Peninsula is today about 20 miles across. Back then, it was much narrower. You could almost throw a rock across it. It was maybe a mile across. So if you've depleted your coastline of shellfish and birds and other animals, and you see loads of it across a narrow waterway, if you're at all clever, you're gonna develop a means to get across. And these people were clever and resourceful. For instance, we know they had seaworthy boats at least they did a few thousand years later because for the last stretch of their journey into Australia, they had to cross more than 37 miles of open ocean, even with the lowered sea levels. These weren't dumb savages. They were creative, innovative, problem-solving people. In closing, I think it's important to note that all humans are 99.9% .9 genetically the same. And of that small one-tenth of 1% 1 difference, some studies indicate as much as 94% of that is just variation among individuals from the same populations. So it's a tiny fraction of a tiny fraction that sometimes makes us uncomfortable or xenophobic or about people who don't look exactly like us. It's good to remember we're all cousins and pretty damn close cousins at that. Well, that's episode three. In episode four, we'll examine where the name Neanderthal came from. It's a really cool story. Everything from the refusal of many in the scientific community in the mid-1800s to accept or even consider the existence of another human species. And when they finally did, almost calling that other human species Homo stupidus. Or people at the time dueling over the issues with sausages. <clears throat> Ugh. Sausages, really? It's riveting and pretty revealing about human nature. I think you'll like it. I'll also tell you a little about my three books and the research that underpins them all. So don't miss it and be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks a lot.